That's a long way, dancing around tree branches and shit. <laughs> Go on down? Yeah. <laughs> hey, how's it going guys? I'm Chris and this is Regular Guy Training. So, today's video, as the title really implies, um, look, this is a subject that I end up having to talk about a lot. It's a subject that I end up having to talk about a lot, but I never really put on video before because I've only ever really had to deal with this in like military circles and that kind of thing. But I figure that there should be some sort of reference material that these guys can go get, especially since, you know, more than a few military folks watch this uh, particular channel. So uh, the idea really is this is really for three different types of people uh, for the most part. Some of you may find this interesting uh, just because, you know, this is what we have to deal with. So... Uh, this is mostly for NCOs that end up having to go teach this, and you just want to make sure that you come correct rather than a bunch of institutionally inbred stuff that you picked up from some guy that sounded like you knew what he was doing, who picked that up from some guy, who picked that up from some guy that was never really all that sure to start with, and he sort of like mysteriously uh, just sort of guessed his way into how a lot of this works. And I've heard a lot of really goofy stuff on ranges and that kind of thing. So I'm going to address a lot of it as far as like the zeroing at 25 meters is concerned because that's what most of us end up doing anyway. We're going to go through, uh, you know, both both sets of optics that are general issue. Right now we're like the M68 or the Aimpoint Comp M4 or uh, the ACOGS, which for the most part is like the TA33 with the RCO reticle. Uh, there are some TAO ones that still exist out there, but they're kind of rare. And for other units like mine that run around with EOTEX as like their standard, uh, this falls into the same category as aim point stuff, at least for this. Just stay with me on this, okay? And then we're gonna, we're also going to talk about irons. So, oh, and this is all, the second person that this is really for uh, is like officer types that now know this and they have to pick this up and go run a range with it. And there's going to be a bunch of little tips in here that'll make your life significantly easier, seeing as a lot of it's your call anyway. So there's that. And then the last one is like the E4 mafia types that are up and coming. They're getting ready to turn in their packet, that kind of stuff. Or they just end up like the dude that is the most interested in this. Because as we can probably tell, there's a lot of different types of people in the army. Very, very few of them like one in 40, I think, are like actual gun guys. And we're not talking about guys that own guns that go shoot. We're talking about guys that go train and that kind of thing. Uh, just because you're far more likely to find gym people or like Brazilian jiu-jitsu people or car guys than you than you are to find like gun dudes and that kind of thing. Uh, for whatever reason, is that is what it is. It's, it's whatever it is, really. Uh, but the point is, is that this is for those people mostly, anybody else that wants to hang out and you know, check this out. Cool. Now, first things first, what is a zero? Okay. Uh, I've been asked this before and the simplest way to really explain this is, okay, look, you have you, you have your sighting system and you have the actual rifle, which is attached to a barrel. Okay. Now all the sighting system really is, is it's a good check for where the bore of the rifle is actually pointed. Okay. Uh, they're not really made for you to shoot better. They're made for you to see better. Uh, and the best way to see is to be able to tell where the bore of this rifle is pointed. So all you're really doing when you're zeroing a rifle is you're adjusting your sighting system to more or less give you a proper reference based off of what your eyeballs see of where the bore is pointed. Okay, it's that's the simplest way to do it. So that there is zero deviation between what you see here and what's actually happening here. Uh, so there you go. I know that's not the proper definition, but it's the easiest way to explain it to people. So if it makes sense, it makes dollars. Now, check it out. Uh, let's go over a couple of things that I hear all the time. First and foremost has to do with a set of irons, or in a lot of cases, I've heard this goofy nonsense from people that mess around with optics and that kind of stuff too. There's a lot of people out there that will go out in front of a group of Joes in a set of bleachers and they will say, hey, before you start your zero ring process, you want to check out your irons. And when you check out your irons, you want to make sure that the front sight post is level with the front sight tower. And you want to make sure that you crank this all the way over to one side and then you want to come halfway and then you want to come back and make the rear sight made up exactly halfway with a little, little line that's in the center there. Uh, so that you can mechanically zero your irons. And some people will even say 
you know, hey, you want to crank all the way over with your optic and then count how many cranks that you go back, okay? And then you want to come back again and cut that in half and so that, you know, so that you can tell that your, your, uh, your optic or your irons are perfectly mechanically reset for each individual shooter because your set of eyeballs are not my set of eyeballs. Everybody sees something differently. Now, this gives me a headache because between one person's reference and another person's reference, it's actually exceptionally rare that you run into people that have like vastly different sets of eyeballs. And even still, if that is the case, it's still less likely to set you up on like the moon than it would be just slightly off or pretty high on your piece of cardboard or whatever, right? So don't do that. Don't do that. Leave the sighting systems alone. Just work with what you have because I see it a lot and it only makes problems worse. I've never seen this make things actually better. And the fact of the matter is, is that per time or evolution that you go up to the zeroing lane, you have 18 rounds to get this zero done. So I have enough issues logistically before I either have to go cycle back through the line or sit there and wait to go draw more bullets. So I'd rather not have to deal with that mess. Uh, I don't know about you. So let's not do that. Let's not touch the sighting systems, especially if you're functioning within an arms room that actually sets out like weapons cards to people and your rifle was previously like owned by somebody else. It's just not very smart. And even without weapons cards, somebody else shot that thing. Somebody else zeroed it or close enough. And you're not going to be that different. So getting off of that, let's go to our zeroing target here. Now, everybody pays attention to the white diamond and the two rings. I got gotcha. you. Uh, a lot of people think they know what the values of the individual squares are, which is annoying because it says it. It says the value of what those individual squares are right below it in this section. Okay. Each individual square equates for one minute of angle, one minute of angle at 100 meters. Now, what that roughly translates to, so that I can define it a little bit, is roughly one inch at 100 meters. So at 25, each one of those individual squares is a quarter inch. So four squares makes a full inch. We'll get back to that here in a second. And below that, we have values for... Uh, the M68, the ACOGS, which is a list of different variants and that kind of stuff, and then your iron sights, right? You'll come to find that the, that the red dots and the ACOGS have the same minute of angle value per individual click. It's at 0.5. Now, those of you that own ACOGS at the house might cock an eyebrow at this. Uh, but as far as military issue and that kind of stuff is concerned, that is true. It is 0.5. Minute of angle, individual clicks for these optics. Now, what does that mean for us? What that means for us is that if that individual click, and we'll start with the red dot because it's just the easiest to do here. Um, what that means is that each individual click is half of a square. So two clicks per one square, which means eight clicks per inch. Four squares per inch. Make sense? So there you go. Same thing for the ACOGs as well, you know, and if your unit issues like EOTEX and that kind of thing, it's the same deal there too. So what that really means more than anything else is that if I have to measure out how far away I am, the easiest way to do that is to simply go to the center of your shot group, figure out how many squares you are away, two clicks per square, and make those adjustments. It's pretty simple. Just follow the directions up, down, or left, or right, on on your actual you know on your actual turrets there and it's pretty simple to go with on that as far as that is concerned now the directions are for your point of impact shift it's not for physical location of the dot okay so if i click four r right for right it's going to move my point of impact to the right and oddly enough it's going to shift the dot location like the dot location as you see it, if you were to sit there and watch it and then crank it, it's actually going to shift that to the left. And it's only because you gotta you gotta do some op you gotta do some realignment and that kind of stuff. So if you shift everything toward a dot that moved left, right? Like it the dot went this way some, so I have to shift my rifle over, it moves the bore to the right. Make sense? 
that'll come back later when we start talking about you know your iron sights but that's just some extra information point is is that if you follow the directions exactly you'll move your point of aim i'm sorry you'll point you move your point of impact exactly where you want it to go okay so that said it's the same thing for your acog okay two clicks per square eight clicks per inch now the only thing that i'll say about the acogs and there's two tips here that you really want to make sure that you pay attention to is that when we're zeroing for 300 meters at 25 meters you'll have the reticle for the acog the rco reticle anyway where you got the chevron the you know you have the upper tip of the chevron the inside tip of the chevron then a little vertical red tick there that little vertical red tick there is your ballistic drop compensation for 300 meters so if you're zeroing at 300 meters use that 300 meter tick to zero at 25. use that tick that little red tick for 300 meters at 25 to zero with because if you use the chevron instead you're going to zero much higher than you actually wanted to make sense also with the acogs particularly if you got your guys like out in the field uh for instance and it's been cold so like if your guys have been sleep and it doesn't have to be crazy cold either but if your dudes have been living in like 30 degrees and it's been raining a bunch because if it's 30 degrees it has to be raining right you may encounter some turret freeze, especially with military optics that have been beat on a whole lot. So what that equates to is if you got all this, if you got all these values and stuff in your head, and you're trying to uh, make adjustments on the zeroing lane, and I've seen this before myself before I knew this, is that you'll you'll make your adjustments, you go shoot again, it didn't move anywhere. You're like, what the fuck? So you'll do twice that adjustment, I guess, to get it moving at least. And then it takes all of that all at once. And it's because on the initial set, it froze up a little bit and then it took all the values afterwards. So the best way really to avoid that, uh, especially when it's cold outside, is once you get your, your cover caps off, before you make your adjustment, do a quick turret knock. Just like that. Make your adjustments and then, and then door knock again. And then you can go from there. What that does is that it loosens things up just enough to where there's no turret freeze and it'll do exactly what you want it to. It's that simple. So that said, let's get to the irons here because there's still a lot of people that have to do a lot of rifle qualifications with their iron sights, particularly guys that end up going to like best warrior competitions or if you're in some sort of schoolhouse, you know, that requires a, a qualification like Bolick or something, right? So... Your irons, these are different, and this is where I have to teach guys a little bit of math here extra uh, before we get into this. Now, for some of you that heard math and you instantly fucked off, I need you to pay attention to something really quick. Look, don't shortchange your people and don't tell them and don't tell lies for children. Okay, these privates and these specialists and stuff absolutely positively know how to do a little bit of math because if they know how to move the precise cent amounts over from their saving account to their checking account so they can pay their bills, pay for the five bangs that they'll need tomorrow to get through the freaking Connex nonsense that you sent them through or inventory that you sent them through again. And then they got to go get some some lady through nursing school later on with their boys when they go to the, to the particular clubs for particular people. They can handle this, okay? And the easiest way to reference a lot of this stuff is that if it makes sense, it makes dollars. Now, here's how I'm going to reference this, okay? Now, the reason why people say tell a lot of lies for children, we're going back to this little chart here, is for the irons. Let's go to the rear sight first. Uh, the rear sight for the M4 and the M16 and their adjustments are identical. You know, the, the only thing that really changes is how far away the front and rear sight are, how these adjust is the same. So... For the rear sight, each individual click is 0.75 MOA, right? Not 0.5, but 0.75. Now, this can this can raise a couple of eyebrows because I've seen a lot of people in a hurry tell people that it's basically the same as you know their their optics, where it's two clicks per square, right? Not so much, okay? And here's why that's not so much. Because every fourth click that you do, you now have an extra box. So if you were to treat this like a regular optic, for instance, right? And you're going to come over two clicks per square. And you're just going to keep on doing that, right? Let's say that we are six boxes away, okay? 
each individual time that you click that thing over a fourth time, you have a whole other box, a whole other minute of angle that bled over from the two clicks that you thought were 0.5 before. So let's say that we're off by, again, six boxes, right? I got two clicks, four clicks, but because of that extra 0.5 that's left over, it's now three boxes, right? And then I got six, eight clicks, but now that's a sixth box. Make sense? So if you were six boxes over and then you did 12 clicks because it's two per with your optics, you overshot, you overshot significantly. And if you're a ways off, like in the far corner of that target, you can be extra, extra off because you're not accounting for that. Okay. So in order to make sense, make dollars. Okay. Just tell your guys for every fourth click that you do, it's an extra full box. It's that simple. Okay. For your front sight, it's the same as far as every fourth click, there's now an extra box. The only difference now is that instead of 0.75, it's 1.25. So each individual click that you do with your iron sight, your front, you know, each individual click that you do is a box plus a little. Okay? So let's say that I'm five boxes off, right? Four individual clicks, for four boxes, and then each quarter that's left over, that adds up to your fifth box. So if I want to cover five boxes, I need to do four clicks. It is that simple. You just got to teach that to your guys. Okay, don't shortchange them. And here's the thing with the iron sights, okay? Uh, I've seen the directions for this confuse people, so I'm going to make this as easy as possible for a lot of guys to figure out. This is a screw. All of them are, but this is a screw, right? If you twist it a right or clockwise... That's going to push it down. It's going to tighten the screw. If you turn to the left or counterclockwise, it's going to pull the front sight up. Now, if I pull the front sight physically up, in other words, loosen it, okay, I'm going to force, I'm going to force my point of impact low because I got to adjust for that alignment. You see? Because if the physical front sight post is higher, I'm going to have to, when I line my eyeballs up again, it's going to push the bore lower. If I push the front sight post down, when I look my eyes through here again, it's going to pull the bore higher. So if you have to come up with your point of impact on the target, take your rear sight and screw down. One more time, if I am five boxes low from my point of impact, let's say that my point of impact is that piece of shade right there, right? I'm five boxes low, right? And I want to bring it higher. I'll take my front sight post and I will adjust clockwise, screwing the front sight post down four clicks so that when I line my sights up again, I'll bring the bore up higher. It's that simple, okay? So that's for the zeroing portion uh, as far as this is concerned. Um, if you want to ask questions through the comments section, you absolutely can. It's really easy to do, but now that you've heard all this stuff, you can reference the actual chart underneath, which tells you everything that I just told you. But now you have a couple of extra uh, a couple of extra explanations on how stuff goes, and a couple of tips on how to make the um, how to make things go a little bit better for you. That's simple, right? But now we're going to move on to the actual zeroing procedure. We're going to go over natural point of aim. We're going to go over shooting straight and all of that stuff. And we're going to go into a more advanced portion of this uh, because here's the deal. A lot of times when you get zero wing targets that are just posted up by people that are just trying to get this over with, you have crooked targets. Okay. And as you can probably figure this, and as you can probably figure out a crooked target can actually screw up your calculation as far as how far away you actually are, as far as boxes to go or how many inches away that you have or whatever. So, what I'm going to teach now is a pretty easy way to measure all this out in inches because you know the number of clicks required for each inch, right? And we're going to use that 
to adjust for a target that has no boxes at all, so it doesn't matter where you are, you can get a solid zero provided you're at the correct distance. So let's move on to that. All right, so an easy way to account for how to measure on a target in case, in case you're zeroing targets really crooked and you're still trying to hit the center of that diamond. The center of that diamond is really gonna be the center of your point of aim and your point of impact later on. But in case you're crooked and you're forced to use an inch method, either you have one of these or you don't. But let's say that you have one of these, okay? Eight clicks per inch. So in order to cover one inch, it'll be eight clicks, right? If you wanna go half inch, it's four. Four clicks per half inch. But if you don't have one of these, you can actually measure this pretty easily with your hand. Now, if you line up two fingers, for instance, right? Two fingers is roughly one inch. If I line up four, you know, starting at the back end of that and rolling that and rolling that over, okay, to where that's at the end there, and you roll this four here, that's roughly two inches. And then if you throw your thumb in, okay, it's roughly two and a half. Now, obviously, that's a really rough approximation, and depending on how big your friggin' hands are, is going to determine, you know, whether or not you want to overshoot or undershoot how many clicks you actually do. But the point is, is that that can help you get by. It's less precise, and it is a guesstimation, but in case you can't accurately measure, you can use, and if you don't have one of these, you can use your hand instead. All right, so we have our measurements in place. We know what our click values are. We know how to carry on some simple math. So let's go ahead and talk about this right here. Okay. The actual shooting part is significantly easier than a whole lot of people will make it out to be. Okay, because in essence, all shooting really is, is take this, point it at that, press good. That's it. So how that translates to your actual shooting fundamentals, which is versus techniques that people teach as fundamentals, okay, is that, because now we're stepping a little bit into my world versus army stuff, okay, in order to get bullets from here to there consistently, you only have three fundamentals, okay, you have sight alignment, which, may, which means line this up, sight picture, which means point it at that, correctly and then good trigger press that's it so side alignment side picture trigger control that is all okay everything else as far as your breathing your position your grip all that other stuff these are all techniques that add or supplement your fundamentals but they absolutely change depending on circumstances so for instance if i'm in a very calm environment like this. I'm not going to do the traditional super deep inhale, super deep exhale because there's nothing to calm down. So all I'm going to do really is breathe normally. And as I'm breathing normally on the exhale, like just in and out of the nose on the exhale, it's when I'm still firing the shot. Okay. If I've been paddle boating, running around a whole lot or whatever, right? That's when the really deep inhale, exhale comes from. Or if I'm planning on moving quickly a lot, that's where the really deep inhale exhale comes from that help that actually does help you calm your body down a little bit but if you're in a really really calm environment like this and you basically start hyperventilating on the range you can accelerate your heart rate and all it does is screw you up down there okay so there's that let's talk about natural point of aim here now natural point of aim is exactly what it implies it's what your it's how your body naturally wants to point at your target area okay so all you're really doing is you're making an X behind your rifle you're settling, you're settling in to make sure that your stock is properly and deeply placed in that shoulder, okay? Where your stock placement is, especially at this point, is based off of comfort more than anything else. If I'm trying to get a solid zero, we're not talking about like tactical environments or anything like that yet, or at all really, because this is just a zeroing process thing. Um, you're, you're wanting comfort more than anything else. Okay, we can talk about stock placement in like tactical environments or for the qualification itself or whatever. Uh, but the nose to charging handle thing or having the same stock placement all the time is a myth. 
What isn't a myth is how consistently you put your face in the same spot every time if you're trying to place an accurate shot. Okay. Now, as far as the stock goes, now, typically, me personally, I do set this at a place where I'm going to want it, whether I'm on the ground or if I'm doing uh, anything that involves getting up, getting down, paddle boating, doing that kind of thing, right? But where that changes, honestly, is if my piece of glass here changes and I'm trying to be more precise, it's when I basically extend all the way, consume as much of a rifle as possible, and that kind of stuff. So you can see how this changes up a little bit. But as far as the zero and pertaining to your qualification is concerned, let's simply do this, okay? Now, as far as the stock placement is concerned, okay, the simplest way to do this is to imagine yourself in, you know, your qualification environment where you got to do that standing shot and you got to do whatever it is that you got to do, right? I'm going to drop this other knee to more accurately convey this. Now, a lot of people will have a lot of different methods on where exactly this stock goes. Me personally, I just do the one the one notch out method at a time where I'll throw this guy in all the way. And when I go in all the way, I'll set up as if I'm going to shoot here. And once I set up as if I'm going to shoot, I'm going to drop one hand out. Now, if I get too much pressure going through the forearm and that kind of thing, and I can feel my hand fighting the nose weight a lot, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the stock and come out one notch at a time, set up again, drop that hand, still a little too much on the wrist. I'm feeling my wrist cave a little bit this way because of the nose weight. Okay, so I'm going to take this. I'm going to extend one more time. Feeling significantly better, but I still got a lot of finger pressure, especially on that middle finger. A lot of the nose weight's drifting it downward. Come out again. Let's go one less than full. That's pretty good. Okay, still have that pressure here, but it's much less. And now we're going to go all the way. And I'm starting to feel extra nose weight again. So I'm going to come back to where that was comfortable before. You can actually tell the difference between where my paint is and where it isn't. It more or less marks where I like it. But because I know that I'm going to be up, down, moving around, that kind of thing, uh, for the qualification, I'm going to keep it in this spot so that I don't have to worry about where my face is planted elsewhere. Because look, the more experience that you have with this, the more shooting that you do, the less the stock placement actually matters. It's just how consistently your face hits the same spot over and over. And for a lot of you that don't have that extra experience, setting it in this spot for both this and the qualification may or may not help you. What I am saying though, is that if you're trying to be more precise, if you're in different billets later on and you start shooting straighter, you might want to use extra stock length, especially if you're stuck with a rifle like this and you have, you know, a four or six or an eight power piece of glass that you now have to flex a little bit further away from. You want to extend that stock a little bit more, consume a little bit more of the rifle between you and the actual stock length and all that stuff. And that does help, but we're going to stay on the rifle qualification here. So that said, now that I have my, my stock adjusted exactly where I want it for this, what's going to happen now is once I'm laid out, Okay, and look, those of you that run ranges or paddle wave and that kind of stuff, look, give those troops a, a second. Give them a second to get themselves set up. Um, what I would personally teach a lot of people, honestly, is I would teach them not to use sandbags a lot or at all. And the reason why I say that is, look, this guy right here, your rifle barrel, if that sets on stuff, okay, you have to think of it this way. You have a 7 to 9 to 11 pound object connecting a single steel pipe at one point on the receiver. So if your barrel is resting on a sandbag because your handguard is really short and that barrel or bayonet lug, most of the time the bayonet lug starts to rest on stuff, that freaking barrel will actually bow itself a little bit okay uh people talk about barrel harmonics and when the and when the rifle fire when the rifle fires there's a lot of psi and the barrel does this whippity action and if stuff is touching that barrel it disturbs that whippity action and that's actually accurate that's real but more than that it, on top of that is you have a steel pipe connected at one point and if there's something pressing upward 
particularly when people bear down on their rifles, they'll push down on them. And if they have uh, like their bayonet lug pushing into a sandbag, that puts a lot of pressure into that steel pipe that's connected at one point. That's your barrel. So not only are your barrel harmonics disturbed, you're also you can also physically move that barrel for the for basically the entire zeroing process. And that dude thinks that that barrel is good to go because he's been pushing into it the same way, really consistent, all that, gets a good tight zero. And then when it's time to go shoot the rifle qualification, his sights are actually off, uh, significantly so, because he's been consistent on one thing and then it gets up and, you know, suddenly there's different stuff acting on the barrel, or in this case, just less things acting on that rifle barrel. So what I tell people, generally speaking, is that you know, if you have those little rubber kajiggers that they use at rifle ranges with that big C, uh, you can use that so that there's just less of that crap and you got to shove your rifle as far forward as possible on it so you can avoid that. Or just don't use that. Okay, you make a good X behind your rifle. Okay, you set your magazine on the ground and you get a good solid position behind it. I mean, I've zeroed rifles that way and then go out and get single shot 600 yard line hits afterward so it's a solid way to zero and i don't need like a, a vice or a table tripod to get a good rifle zero okay especially for what it is that we're doing right now and that's like inside like at an inside 300 okay so how do we set up good as far as a natural point of aim behind that rifle now look when you set guys up behind this again you make that x behind that rifle you line this up into that, uh, you know, into that good stock placement on their shoulder. And a good stock placement isn't super high, meaning there's a ton of this bleeding up over the top of their shoulder. I mean, good and deep inside of that shoulder. But you set them up like so. And when you teach natural point of aim, okay, the easiest way to teach natural point of aim to people is you get them just to breathe normally, in and out with their, with, you know, their, uh, in and out with, with their nose, as far as the air goes and breathing, okay? You get them to line up, and right at the end of that exhale, that's where that dot should be dropping into the center of that target. So, you set up. Once it settles in the center of that target, just close your eyes and do one more good breath. So if that's where it needs to be, keep them right there. If it's not, tell them to move their entire body to compensate for it. Not just their rifle, have them move their whole body. Okay, so here's the other thing too, as far as what to do with your hands, right? The second part of the MPA that I teach people is once that's good and centered up in there, I tell them to let their hand go and do it one more time. So we got it good in that one spot. So let's do it again. And there we are. Now, the reason why I do this is you'd be shocked how much pressure people put on their hand guards just by touching them. Okay. Now, if you could see easily through the camera, there was actually a little bit of movement in here the second I let this go. Because I have a tendency to grip that rifle pretty hard either way. Like, I'll, I'll grip with my fingers just squeezing a little too much. So, a lot of times when you let go, there's some movement in there and then it settles someplace else. So if you can get that rifle to settle without that grip hand in a good spot and then just add your hand without squeezing or adding tension or whatever, it's the best possible NPA that they could have. Now, an extra tip that I give some people is a lot of times if they grip a little bit too hard, this is just something that I've been doing for a while and it does help out a lot of guys, is instead of trying to grip your hand guard like so, okay, or like so, all I do, especially seeing as there seems to be a lot of pressure that gets thrown into this elbow and it starts to feel weird, all I really do at that point is once I settle in here, I'll turn this over and just let the weight of my hand sit on the top of that hand guard. So all it's doing is keeping me from moving around as far as turning and all that. 
and I don't have to add a whole lot of pressure and it doesn't disturb that NPA at all. Okay, so that's a pretty simple way to do all that. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna fire a shot group. Okay, this is zeroed for something else, so it's likely to be slightly off here. But I'm gonna fire a shot group here. And once I fire that shot group, we're gonna go up there, talk about measurements, and get ourselves guided in. By the way, that target is 25 meters away. And by the way, when you make adjustments to your body, reset your natural point of aim checks. <sighs> and I look, a couple other things too. A great way to check whether or not, you know, your dudes have good NPA is if you watch the line, especially from an almost horizontal perspective. If you watch the line and you see a guy fire a shot and those sights go exactly back to where they're supposed to be, meaning there's no extra shifting from that dude, okay, that's a solid natural point of aim. If you see a shot fired and you see that rifle move a whole lot and then you see him having to physically pull that that rifle back or you see him fidgeting per individual shot that dude's got a lousy natural point of aim so it's on you whether you're running it or you're paddle waving for it give these guys time to set up their natural point of aim because if they take a little bit of extra time now what they're not going to be is a pain in your ass all day long because they're not consistent behind the gun ever Make sense? You know, make sure that they're lining up their sights proper. Make sure that their dots are in the center of their reticles. Make sure that they don't have scope shadow um, by leaning the reticle and their ACOGs off to one side or the other too much. Make sure that their irons are lined up in that right before they're getting ready to press on that trigger shoe, have them shift their focus to their irons really quickly, like as a whole, and make sure that the front is lined up with the rear, then focus back on that front sight and press through that trigger shoe. It helps with a lot of little issues that you can run into from guys that are just inconsistent because they don't have the reps, All right? So let's go up there and uh, let's talk about some target stuff. All right, so what we're looking at here is we are slightly low and slightly right, okay? Because the center of that shot group is right in here, okay? So with the center of that shot group being right here, and yeah, I'm using crappy ammo. You guys are using M85, M855A1, I'm using some really, really cheap trash, frankly, but the principles are the same. So you can actually see, you know, I'm round about one inch low, okay, and round about, let's call it a little over half of an inch to the right. So all this really means is it, I'm going to have to come up eight, because it's eight clicks per inch and because I'm a little over a half of an inch to the right uh, all I'm going to do at that point is I'm going to come over let's try five instead of the full eight all right so we're back here we're going to set ourselves back up I'm going to remove my eye pro here just so that you can see everything that I'm doing Let's go see. 
All right, so we made our first set of adjustments and we're pretty close to where it is that we want to be. Uh, there's a flyer in there because, you know, I can't be super consistent all the time, but the data is getting closer to where it is that we want to be on this, okay? Uh, especially if you're running ranges, I highly recommend that uh, you not do six for the initial. Reason for this is actually pretty simple. You don't have a lot of ammo to do this. You have 18 rounds, and you have people that are not very used to getting a lot of reps in. Now, I understand the theology behind, you know, firing the initial six so that, you know, you can see a little more data on that person. But the thing is, is that, especially with guys that don't have a ton of reps, um, what you run into a lot is guys that just can't focus that good for that long. Um, with something that is as box checky as this. So what you run into is a lot of trash data. So if you can get them to focus and dial in real tight for three rounds at a time, it's a little bit easier to collect data off these folks and make good and proper uh, adjustments off of them. Make sense? So let's get another group in here and let's see what there is to see. Now you notice that I'm not using a regular pistol grip in here, okay? And the reason for that is actually pretty simple. All I have to do more than anything else is a set up, no extra hand on here, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna squeeze on this pistol grip, okay? Because people have a tendency to crush with their grips. Just watch what happens to the rifle when I do that. So what you get into as far as issues like that is concerned is when people start doing this motion with their trigger fingers, they start to also crush that grip and it'll move that rifle over some. Especially if you have guys that hit the fuck it button where like right at the end, they really push it over. Um, it doesn't help a whole lot. But if you just can't that thumb out, okay, just watch what happens when I, when I try to squeeze my fingers in this way. See, there's still some movement in there, but it's a whole lot less, and it's way more this way instead of that way. Makes sense. Let's go down there and see what we got going on. Oh, and last thing, really, uh, and this pertains specifically to your dots. Uh, your dots are not designed uh, to be focused on specifically like your front sight post is. Uh, they're meant for you to keep both of your eyes open and looking down there and then drifting a dot over, and then drifting a dot over with, you know, your body. So if you keep your irons, I'm um, sorry, your dot, okay, just floating out in space, you keep both eyes open and focused on the target over there, you're not going to see as much sunbursting, and you're not going to detect as much movement in that dot too. So because you can focus over there and just drift the, tar the, the dot over, It'll be significantly easier to close up those shot groups a lot. Makes sense. Okay, so we are a little bit off to the right here. So I'm going to click this guy over a little bit again. But we'll see what happens. Oh, and as an oh, by the way, we get closer and that kind of stuff. You know, I'm still, I'm still slinging in the occasional nonsense in here. But the group itself, it like it's less, but it still likes to hang out a little bit low and right. So I got to come over just a little bit more. Turns out with my little hand, my little hand measurement here, it could have been just that I wasn't uh, my sights over as much as I needed them to. So that's the 
inadequacy more or less with just using your hands to measure. It's not very precise. All right, so we made our little adjustments. Let's get fired up. Changed my bullets. Okay. Let's go see. Oh, and uh, another thing on the dots, and actually on the ACOGs too, you want to turn down the brightness a little bit too. You don't want any sun bursting in the dots or anything like that, so you're going to want to turn down the brightness a little bit so you can see good. And in addition to that, um, with the ACOGs, you're going to want to use either like tan masking masking tape or black friction tape. I've seen a lot of electrical tape get used. I've used it before, but it doesn't stick very good for very long. So you're going to want to use like black friction tape so it stays there and you can dim down the, the brightness a little bit so that you can actually see well. Uh, as far as your reticle is concerned, there's no sun bursting, there's no target obscurity over there, that kind of thing. Oh. Made a little bit further of an adjustment, okay? And I'm moving in pretty precise amounts, but you can see we're a little, we're a bunch of that low, we're a bunch of that low left nonsense went away. We're starting to chew the X and that kind of thing. So it's not uh, super precise, but if you can go off of like inch, inch estimations, especially if you're, if you're pretty good at, you know, measuring distance um, in that way, it's pretty easy to get very quickly lined up with exactly what it is that you want to do. Now, uh, I'm going to continue to do this uh, to confirm because the data looks like it's there, right? I look like I'm chewing the thing I want to chew. Uh, but here's the other thing too, and here's what I am going to tell you to tell your dudes all the time. And that is if you have ammo left and you're where you want it, spend the rest of that ammo, okay? Because you need to be able to confirm what it is that you're doing. You never know if you just got lucky one time, okay? Because this isn't a math class test where the second that you get the right answer, it's over and done with. You actually need to be consistent. So, let's go again. Almost jumped the shark there. And I'm glad I didn't because my MPA was all screwed up. That's better. Give them time to do this. Let's go check it out. So yeah, all it really turns into is just do three rounds at a time, okay? Do three rounds at a time, just let them go through their progressions, let them get from wherever they need to be down to where they need to be, because look. Oh, and the other thing too is, dude, if they're not zeroed, if they're not zeroed, don't pull them off the line. Let them finish. They're already starting to get warmed up at this point. Don't let them get discouraged. Don't let them have to think, oh shit, now I have to wait a whole other hour for these other dudes to go. No, keep them right there and just give them bullets and be like, listen, you're not there yet. It's fine. 
Because, look, I take all fucking day. Because I do take all day. Okay? Because, look, if you don't have a solid zero, you don't have anything. Ever. So, don't... Look, don't be the leader that tells people to just accept mediocrity. Let them stay there, get what they need, and encourage that. And you'll end up with not just better zeros, but better qualification scores altogether. And here we are. We're just continuing to chew what it is that we need to chew. Okay. Um, so, look. One last thing that you're going to want, uh, as far as your optics are concerned, is because you're at 25 and not at, at 25 meters and not 36 yards. Like 36 yards is a way better approximation zero for 300 meters because it's good point of aim, good point of impact. 25 meters is actually just a little bit too close. There is a little bit of a holdover that you're going to have to personally deal with. So if guys are like in the diamond and they're pretty precise, have them shade their group just a little bit lower like just a little bit lower, like the bottom quadrant of the dot, and it's a little better for that approximation. It's not perfect, but it's a little bit better. Okay, so if they're capable of that, encourage that. As the saying goes, if you don't have a solid zero, you don't have anything. All right, y'all. I hope you found that um, useful, at least for what it is that uh, you're getting ready to do. I have to take this back to a 50-yard line zero now because that's my personal preferred, but that's a completely different discussion. Uh, look, I don't shill, but I do have bills. So if you guys want to come out and train with us, you absolutely can. Link for the website is in the description below. We have a bunch of different places that are scattered into different areas as far as like rifle and pistol and various other stuff. I do do private classes as well, particularly to groups. So that's a thing. Uh, if you want to get in contact with us over a private class, that's pretty easy because uh, contact information for me is on the website as well. If you want to check us out on Facebook, you absolutely can. Again, link for that is in the description below. Uh, and also, oh, also uh, if you want to help us out as far as like Patreon and that kind of stuff, throwing a couple of bucks at us a month really, really does help, especially with all the nonsense that's gone on over the last few years uh, regarding quite a few things. So, you know, that does help a lot. And if you want to get something out of it, $41 a month gets you as much training as you want as far as, you know, just coming out, being able to throw yourself into an open enrollment class, be like, hey, I'm a $41 a month guy. I would need, like, the email you use for that Patreon account so that I can go look you up. Once you're verified, cool, I can throw you on a roster. It's no big deal. 
Uh, so if you want to get something out of that, you absolutely can. But whether it's training with us, Patreon, or the Facebook page, if you want to check out any of this stuff, links are in the description below. And also, remember, a regular guy's firearm is the last defense against tyranny. Easy.